As residents uh, of the Port Huron area, we live next door to a foreign country. Although we don't really think of it as a foreign country, we think of it as Canada, our next door neighbors. We drive over there for a night out. We drive over there when the gas prices were lower. I drive over there to go to the casino. We drive over to visit friends. Our children think it's just an extension of Michigan. And Canadian children probably think Port Huron is an extension of Canada. Only a few hundred yards of beautiful St. Clair River separates us. One of the favorite pastimes of tourists and residents alike is sitting by the water and looking at Canada, looking at the shoreline, looking at the St. Clair River, watching the ships go down. And we've been river gazing for over a century now. Here's a couple of ladies sitting in Pine Grove Park looking at the river. Back before wide-angle lens, this uh, enterprising photographer took uh, two photographs and spliced them together. Today we see freighters like this uh, going up the St. Clair River. And some of the freighters that we see are huge, over a thousand feet long. The freighters I remember growing up were freighters like the Benson Ford. This was the top of the line back then, over 600 feet, which was considered huge. And it was uh, this and a sister ship, uh, Henry Ford II, was the first uh, ships uh, on the lakes that had diesel engines. We lived on Michigan Street only uh, a block from the river. And when either one of the Ford ships were coming uh, down the river, we could hear them as they came and we could hear them as they went because those diesel engines were loud. They were boom, 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 boom. When we heard the noise, we said, here comes one of the Ford grandkids again because that's who the ships were named after. But eventually, like most freighters, it joined the scrap heap. But part of it still lives on today on the Lake Erie summer home. When I was smaller, the freighters were more modest in size, more like this one right here in front of the Black River. And even this freighter would have seemed huge compared to this one here. If you were looking out in the river in the 1800s, you would have seen schooners and you would have seen steamers. And these steamers also had sails on them. If you look closely, you can see the mast. This is a light-hearted sketch of the first steamer that folks would have seen come up the St. Clair River. Her name, Walk in the Water, was given to her by Indians. Because that's what the that ship appeared to do with those paddle wheels on the side. Here's a little more realistic view of the ship. It was a passenger freighter. Her passenger quarters were all below deck. The women's cabins were partitioned in the forward part of the boat. The men's quarters uh, followed. Next was the small dining room, and last, the tiny smoking room, which was connected to the baggage room. Since the steam whistle had not yet been invented, the walk in the water proudly displayed a small cannon mounted on her forward deck. This was used to signal the ship's intentions. It was always fired just before she docked to inform the people of the port of her arrival, and a farewell shot was customarily fired upon her departure. Hopefully there were blanks. In 1989, a stamp was dedicated to a walk in the water steamship. Steamboats were initially used for passenger uh, transportation. The heavy lifting of freight was still being done by the schooners and barges. In about 1825, uh, the owners realized that there was a tremendous profit to be made not in carrying passengers, but in towing both the schooners and the barges. This drawing here was made from the Canadian side about where the bridge is now, looking toward Port Jerry. And if you look up the head of the schooners, you can see that little tug pulling them. In this bird's eye view map of the 1800s, you can see the schooners uh, being pulled uh, right near where the bridge is now. Uh, see the tug pulling the schooners there. And going the opposite way, you'll see the tug pulling barges. And here you see the Malta Black River. 
in the late 1700s, early 1800s, you would have seen this on St. Clair River, Indians fishing. At one time they may have looked like this, but by the 1800s they were dressing the same way a white man dressed uh, in those days, as you can see in this picture here. In the schooner days following 1820, a favorite sport of the numerous Indians living along the St. Clair River was to roll or paddle out to a schooner and toss her a line and get a tow up the St. Clair River. Sometimes four or five in succession would tail to a single schooner. At the rapids, they would let go and drift and fish their way homeward. Getting loose was easy for the late arrivals, but the first canoe sometimes found it difficult to persuade a teasing deckhand to cast off at the right time. The first Low River steamers were equally obliging, but the deckhands devised new schemes to torment the Indians. One was to tie a lump of coal to the end of the line, the line dropping like a plummet through the canoe off balance and the Indian had a battle before he could right the crab. Usually though he thriftily retrieved the coal and took it home. One Indian who sneaked a tow from the fast paddle wheel steamer city of Toledo while she was docked ran into difficulties when the captain decided to back his ship, smashing the canoe. The Indian swung himself clear by grabbing the struts and thus rolled carelessly to the steamer's next stopping place. With the advent of faster steamboats, towing practice was banned in the interest of safety, and some of the joy departed from Indian life on the river. The Indians were an important part of the early life of Fort Chiron, so it shouldn't be really any surprise that the first ferry system was run by, you guessed it, the Indians. After the Indians uh, ferried people across, there became a hodgepodge of uh, different people. Anybody that had a boat had a ferry service, and if you had the money, they'd take you across or take your supplies across. Uh, it wasn't regulated at all, either by Canada or by Michigan. In March 1837, an application was made to the Michigan legislature, and an act was passed giving Norman Nash and Nicholas Eyrault the right to keep and maintain a ferry across St. Clair River, near the mouth of Black River. Documents I examined from uh, Michigan didn't really give what kind of a ferry it was, but uh, Canadian documents I looked at said it was a uh, sailboat. I imagine that could have been challenging from time to time. Later came the horse ferries. I know, there were probably ferries that take horses across, and they were, they did take horses across, but they actually powered the ferry. This is a good illustration of how it worked. Uh, you can see the two horses, one on each side, and they're on actually a treadmill. And this treadmill would make this other wheel below them go around, which in turn powered the paddles. And I do believe this is Port Yaron's first horse exercise gym where they could work out on a treadmill. The first horse ferry was actually a mule ferry. It was powered by one mule and then it was powered by two mules and then when the competition went to horses, they uh, went as far as four horses, which would give it quite a bit more power. And that's pretty much either two or four horses what uh, most of the ferries ended up with. Of course, you can see by the paddle wheels here, this isn't the Port Sharon Ferry, but it does give you an illustration of a four-horse uh, ferry system. And here's a photograph of one. I'm not sure if these are horses or mules, but uh, they're doing the job, whatever they are. And here you can see the cargo that uh, they're taking across the river. Horse ferries came in different sizes. This is a pretty large one, but uh, here's a very small one. I'm not sure uh, what they could take across on that ferry other than the two horses, but perhaps some people. James Muffet uh, became a ferry service owner. And he was also a tug and ferry builder. Uh, along with Daniel Reynolds, he operated the Port Huron and Sarnia ferry line that docked at the foot of Butler Street. Uh, today would be Grand River, and you can see it on this map. Uh, it had been just south of the White Star Dock. The ferries would have pulled in right behind uh, 
the steamships like uh, the Taj Mahal, which is shown here, uh, docked at the White Star Dock. Now they are based at the foot of Butler Street. Uh, there was two small ferries that did the bulk of the work. That was the Grey Stormer and the James Beard. And then later on, they were based in Black River. The Omar Conger uh, joined them, as well as a couple other ferries, and we'll try to look at all of those today. In 1891, Henry McMoran founded the Port Yearn and Sarnia Ferry Company. In this photograph here, we can see three of the ferries I just mentioned, the James Beard, the Grey Stormer, and Omar Conquer. This is indeed a wonderful photograph. It's a high definition, which means when we zoom in, you can get a lot of detail. So we're going to take some time on this. But uh, another wonderful thing is that someone colorized it. Which makes it even more interesting. So let's zoom in and see what we can see in this picture. Well for sure this ferry coming in Black River is the James Beard. And if we look closely up into the uh, wheelhouse we can see the, the wheelsman and we can see the wheel there. In the background you can see the railroad bridge and uh, this is the old swing bridge and it's in this closed position. And as we look to the left of the James Beard we see the Grey Stormer is docked uh, at the ferry dock. You might have realized that this ferry dock is closer to the railroad bridge than it is to the Military Street Bridge. And here, if you look uh, closely, you can see where it says uh, Ferry Ticket Office on this little box of a shack there that they use for the ticket office, I guess. Behind the Grey Stormer, the larger ferry you can see is the Omar Conquer. And we'll be looking at all three of these ferries individually. Alright, let's see what else there is to see. To the left of the Conquer, you see a large advertisement <clears throat> for uh, cigars. The Chief Battle Cigar, the Five Cent Cigar, and the General Mercer, the Ten Cent Cigar. In the background by the railroad bridge, you can see that large smokestack that was from the Porcher and Power and Light Company. Here we see another advertisement, and this is actually where the business is. It was called the uh, William Frazier Wagons, Buggies, and Farm Implements. And then just above that, that tall structure, that was the McMoran Grain Elevator. And just below that, we see that there's a, a printer and binder business here in that green sign. Here we see a partial sign, can't quite make out the name of the business, but it's of dry goods, millinery, and cloaks and suits. It's pretty amazing what we can see in a picture if the picture is clear enough to give us the details. And this one was. Here we see the James Beard uh, already turned around in Black River heading back towards Sarnia. And of course, if we look closely, we can see some passengers on board going over to Sarnia. So I'll stand over there in the bow. And of course, the train bridge. We can see the uh, bridge control uh, house there on the side. And it looks like a sailboat beyond that. This photograph must have been cropped because I found another photograph that has an expanded view. Same photograph, it's just a, a little wider angle here. And you can see on the left, there's a few more things to look at. It's hard to make out, but this sign here on the dock level says, Baseball, Sunday. 
And as we continue uh, a little further up, we see the Port Huron Savings Bank pays interest on deposit. And it says it's in the Opera Block. And as we go up a little further, we see Canham & Son Wholesale Canned Goods. And then over to the right, we see an advertisement for an upcoming event, the uh, Lou Dockstetter and his great minstrels. I researched this fellow a little bit, and this is what I came up with. Lou Dockstetter uh, wasn't his real name. His real name, uh, George Albert Clapp. And I can see where he might want to change his name. Uh, but he was a singer, a comedian, vaudeville star. But he was best known as a blackface minstrel show performer in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Dockstetter performed both as a solo act and leading a popular minstrel troupe. Various popular entertainers of the era performed with Doc Statter's minstrels, the most famous being a young Al Josen. I have a short clip here of one of his songs you can listen to. It doesn't sound at all like he, you know, well, like you think he would sound, judging from his looks. Here it is. Everybody works but father. <laughs> I go to my work, overcoat buttoned up round my neck, no job I would shirk, wintry wine flow round my head, cutting up my face, I tell you what I'd like to have, my dear old father's place. Cause everybody works but father, he sits around all day. In front of the fire, smoking his pipe of clay, mother takes him washing, so does sister Anne. I realize today that menstrual shows certainly are insensitive, but I want to give you an idea of what passed for entertainment when this picture was being taken, and since it is a historical uh, video, I thought it would be uh, uh, something that would be worthwhile putting in. All right, back to the fairies. Here's a great shot of the James Beard on the St. Clair River. And uh, I guess you can pretty well identify this by the big flag they had out in the mob, Beard. No mistake in that. And of course, the signage on the top of the wheelhouse. And here you can see some of the pastures coming across the river. And here you can see the uh, shoreline of Sarnia. James Beard was nicknamed Jimmy Whiskers. And that's what he referred it to. Hey, I'm going over to Sarnia on the Jimmy Whiskers. You want to come with me? In 1918, the Jimmy Whiskers uh, sunk at a Sarnia dock. And you can see the gray stormer pulling up alongside it. I can't find any documentation, but I do believe I read that the James Beard was raised and used again. Well, I'm nowhere near done with the Port Huron Sarnia Ferry, so I guess we'll continue this in our next video.